when you have like a, like breadth and depth, and both are very like large enough, no one person can actually maintain everything at the same time. Like yeah, you're expecting that you're within your functional area. There's a lot of depth. There is a lot of things that you need to architect within your area. Like it's not it's not gonna be uh, like an, I'm, I'm not gonna add a function here or like no. There's tons of complexity and things Services. within your area of expertise. So so even if you try like like even even as an architect you don't even have a whole breadth of picture that doesn't you usually have a team and you have you're working with your software engineer and tech leads and staff engineers or whatever just to get an idea of how complicated the system is especially that the system like like that's maybe once that's one of the areas where the analogy kind of breaks down with actual architecture that software is an organic architecture it moves changes so it's like a function of time yeah, so rather than like an architecture, once you build a building, pretty much it's going to stay the same. Uh, but but in software, it as you're building it, it changes. <laughs> as you like, as you wait for a few minutes, and it changes again. Um, it's 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 kind of a it's it's fascinating, but it's also very challenging, and it's kind of hard for each each developer to be super aware of everything happening outside of their area of scope. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. Today, I have a really amazing guest. We're going to be talking about a very special topic, which is software architecture. I know a lot of you have um, know a lot about software architecture before, maybe not. Also, uh, some of you have worked with software architects and teams, some of you have not. So in today's episode, we're going to be covering everything regarding this topic, from what it is, why do we need it, the dynamics of software architects in the team. And to be honest, I cannot think of a better person to help me answer these questions than Hamad Sharif. He's a bit of a legend in the field. He has an impressive background. Uh, we're going to start by uh, asking him to tell us a little bit more about his background, where he started. Um, Hamad has worked in Apple, uh, sorry, in Microsoft, at Hulu, at VMware, at Okta. And very recently, he took on a software architecture position at Apple. So, uh, Hamad, I'm very happy that you were able to join me today. Me too. I mean, too. Thank you very much for making the time on Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Relax. And um, Hamad, can you tell me a little bit more about your background? How did it start? How did you move to the United States, where you are currently located? Sure. Yeah. So um, it all like started like I, I studied uh, like my like my training is computer engineering. Um, so I have a degree in computer engineering that's like back in 2005. So so that's like pretty pretty long time ago. Um, but I also kind of started professionally working in software uh, even be, a little bit before graduating. Um, so I worked in in, um, in the field, especially around like web development. That was like very early web, like we're talking about ASP Classic and earlier versions of PHP and like these kind of like the relics, fun <laughs> <laughs> the fun times. Um, uh, so that was like very like early, like 2002, 2003, like this time. Um, and uh, I was always fascinated by this kind of like problem space, uh, like web and distributed systems and, mm -hmm. and all sorts of things. And even without having names to these things, like I didn't even get to the point where I was starting to, to this, like studying these things as subjects in college, but it looked like I was already using like databases and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then like shortly after graduating, I kind of started working in different startups in, in Egypt, uh, like for like three Three, three and a half years or so. Uh, and then I got a chance to join Microsoft in uh, in, in Vancouver, Canada first, okay. uh, which basically was like the earlier, uh, like Bing advertising, uh, uh, like uh, it wasn't called Bing at the time, it was called Live, Live Search. Oh, interesting. So, okay. well, like, yeah, that was like, yeah, it's, it's like a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I remember when Bing became a name, like we were like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we were like already working on these things for a while. Um, but yeah, so that was like, um, but that was like one of the biggest systems I've ever worked on, like early in my career. Like that was like, I was a few years in, I was already working like a pretty big system that was like the number, like number two biggest system, biggest uh, search engine and advertising system in, in, the, in at least in the US. Mm -hmm. um, and then also there was like some, uh, during my time, like we did also the integration with Yahoo. Uh, so yeah, who was like wow. uh, take like uh, moving their search traffic and advertising traffic to, to Microsoft? 
It was also part of the, what I what I did back there. I was like also stuck pretty early in my career, but I was working in, in, in that integration part as well. So like yeah, you how, can see how how much traffic. Oh, go ahead. How did this trans? How did this move to Vancouver happen? Like uh, yeah. you. So yeah, so it was basically um, at, around that time Microsoft was doing a lot of international hiring. Um, okay. It was happening like in Egypt. It was also happening in a few other countries in the region, uh, in Turkey and Jordan and like other places. Uh, so they were coming at least regularly. Different teams coming to hire. Um, they were like looking for like sometimes college college grads, sometimes like like early industry hires. Okay. So so kind of like I think I applied maybe a couple of times before. Uh, once out, uh, right after graduation and maybe one one time after and was lucky. Um, like the third time was the charm. <laughs> so <laughs> so the third time, like like part of it, like like I had no idea what to expect. That was like there was no uh, like uh, there Reference. was very limited resources back then. Like yeah, you didn't even exactly. know what to expect when Microsoft was interviewing you. Like you have exactly, no idea. Exactly. Like, <laughs> no content creators, no yes. videos that will tell you the whole no, process. You see, the it's like the whole exactly. YouTube thing wasn't even around. <laughs> exactly, so, exactly. so yeah, so you're basically rolling the dice. Like you're you're getting like on, a, on an actual phone call, like on a landline with a recruiter wow. <laughs> on the yeah. other end from a different country. <laughs> uh, and you're kind of expected to like understand what's happening. And, and then like you're getting like some questions and then like you move to the next stage and, and eventually yeah. you will actually have a face-to-face -face interview. Like they would fly over um, to Egypt in one, one, one day, like in some time, somewhere in Cairo and like- Oh, so they will come to Egypt? They will come, yeah. Oh, Sometimes like there are some odd cases like where like the timing didn't work and they have like maybe a few candidates, they would make them fly to the US sometimes, but, or, or some other like uh, maybe in Europe or somewhere else. But like more often, they, at least at that time, they were like, they were coming very regularly. And they, and they will go through a lot of candidates this way. Cause also like traveling people to other places, like with all the visas and all the things, exactly. it takes a lot of time. Operationally yeah. and logistically, it's a big yes, deal. Yes, exactly. Right? Even with that, even with that setup, was taking a lot of time. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so Vancouver specifically was because of the visa issues in the U.S. So it's like mm -hmm. getting an H-1B visa. That was, I have a whole podcast about that. <laughs> about, about the whole it was still, funnily, it's still until today, Yanni. It's, it's, and it gets getting worse. worse. <laughs> it's getting even worse. Um, so back then was like you're and and yet in some in, in, in certainly in some degree, like you're it's a basically a lottery and 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 with all the and uncertainty around it so microsoft started like a, a vancouver based development center and that development center was because it was very close to seattle so same time zone like even if you want to like drive to the to the to meet your manager or like something like that it takes like a couple of hours to be there so mm -hmm. it's it's a very convenient spot uh so that's why like we we went to the to vancouver and was like alone was like pretty group of people actually had a few friends <laughs> going there together. So it wasn't like like one person going. I was like, yeah, I had like a few, few like a group of my friends as well. We were all kind of having our first day uh, in Microsoft in Vancouver. That's amazing. And you spent yeah. about four years at Microsoft, right? Uh, like it depends on what time because I had two, <laughs> two, two, two times in Microsoft. So it's like yeah. the first time it was like a four and a half years. I think it like between 2008 till 2012 ish. Mm -hmm. uh, so like around yeah three and a half four years around that time, um, and then I <clears throat> left Seattle, left Microsoft, and went to California and Los Angeles. I joined Hulu, and that, that stayed there for a couple of couple of years. And then I did the unthinkable and went back, <laughs> <laughs> and I joined I'm Microsoft that, again. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's quite common nowadays. Yes. And and we, if we're gonna talk about you know compensation and how it happens in big tech, it's very common for people to yes. leave and then come back and leave and come back. They have a name for it now. They, use, they, they call it the boomerang. <laughs> I didn't have. I didn't know. <laughs> I was I was doing a boomerang without even knowing that that's. Yeah. <laughs> you were pioneering the concept. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, only if I had like the marketing angle, I would have like. Put a name on it yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah but that was like the uh, like i went back i was like it's like a collection of reasons like mostly like family stuff like that yeah but for us like seattle was a little bit easier to uh to live than in, in that area and in that time in los angeles got it um and 
Sorry, I, I was going to interrupt you because yeah, I'm, I'm interested also in your progression through VMware, Okta, and sure. more recently, Apple. Yeah. Um, so where the, the first time you got the title Principal Software Engineer was at Okta or was it before? Yes, it was in Okta, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell so me a little the, bit more about the role and, and what, what does it take to be a Principal Software Engineer? So I think like, it, like roles can be a little bit hard to define, especially in software. Like you, every, com every com uh, company has their kind of core tenants of whatever what the role is uh, for me it's like it's like how much degree of uncertainty and, and vagueness in the problem space you're working in and, and how comfortable you are to work with it so and also there's a lot of things about like scope and influence and all these nice things and that's that's totally irrelevant um but but i think that at least for like how i personally perceive it is like how vague the problem space you're working in and how comfortable you are into defining this. So like if you're like a, just like a fresh grad or like very early career or something like that, uh, you are focusing more on the actual craft. You want to actually like make your programmers, like sharpen your programming skills, making sure that you're kind of getting your uh, tasks like in a very high quality, very like on time and everything. But, but the presumption about this, that the tasks themselves are very well defined. Um, so you know exactly like you're going to fix a bug or add a, like a small feature or a feature or something. The, the aspects of it is kind of well known. Um, like as you transition in, like, like kind of grow in your career, like to a, like a mid senior or a senior level or like a staff or whatever, this definition kind of becomes part of your job. Like to, to actually defining what the problem is. Uh, you, you you know maybe a direction like we want to be in that space or we want to like tackle this big like problem we want to like conquer this market or whatever. Yeah, the strategy and, is defined, but the how. Yeah, the strategy is kind of defined, uh, but you're but and maybe in in a way we want to do something here, but how to break this into maybe a smaller projects or like uh, or like maybe it takes like like a two three years strategy like a like a like a planning to actually yeah. land this. This is part of what you're doing. Um, so the actual execution of this, you might be part of it, like you might be actually working in some aspects of it or multiple places. And more often than not, like other people will be helping, like other teams, sometimes even other groups. Uh, and, and sometimes like if it's a whole, like a huge integration problem, maybe other companies as well. They might be like, like Fantastic. maybe you're building a platform or something and people are yeah. building on top of that. So, so it's like, so it, your scope and your, your uh, like effectiveness in, in in bringing this together becomes like very important part of your job. It's like think, some, yeah, they call it sometimes like quarterbacking. Like you're kind of prime, kind of making sure that people are like moving in the right direction, and you kind of help with that. That's fantastic. I think this is a great segue, you know, to start digging into our topic for today. Yeah, and, and I always like to start with the fundamentals. So. In our field, there's not a lot of, um, how do you call it, a rigor, or maybe not everything is very well defined. So I want your take on defining what is software architecture, pretty much on building up on what you just shared with me about being a yeah. software <laughs> So if, if roles were big, <laughs> that role is the biggest. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, so the thing is, like, I, I personally like to define it, like, in, in, at least to make it a little bit simple. So in any big enough system, you have two kind of priorities there is like the functional part of the system like what do we do like what's the actual features that we're adding like let's say that this is like an e-commerce website or something we have to like like sell stuff display stuff like search for like the like these are the main aspects but there's also the other part which is called the kind of the structural part of the system like how this system is actually kind of existing and and withstanding all this uh like changes and traffic and 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 like change and everything, like these fundamental parts, there's somebody else needs to be looking at. So basically, they're not necessarily like like competing, like but they're more or less like very uh, kind of um, um, integrating in a way. Like like you can't like for example, if you're adding a feature that is, is a, like kind of stress one of the tenants of the system. Like for example, let's say that we have a certain like uh, our backend is tested up to a certain like capacity limit. But the feature you're adding might stress that a little bit. Now you need to work with your architects, trying to figure out how we can either uh, f find out find a way to upgrade that backend so it actually can help you, or maybe add layers of like caching or whatever, so it's like so we can actually work around that. So so you you'll find the software engineers and us software architects usually come together, especially around these areas of like 
uh, like um, uh, around the themes of the system. Like when, when okay. be between these components, like when I need to ask some uh, like other components or integrate with something else, uh, how can I make that integration safe, uh, like in terms of security and like performant? I want to make it like seamless, so at least it doesn't look like every time it goes down something like like. Uh, uh, like the user experience suffers because of this. So we will need to kind of work to make sure that when you're building your system, you're building your feature, it's not um, like have a side, doesn't have a side effect or yeah. negatively affect it other things. Behaves as intended, but also exactly. plays well it's, with it's all the other like, aspects of the system. Yeah, it's like basically, I, I don't like, like to put a lot of analogies with, with, other, with other type of engineering, but I think the closest, if you want to have an analogy, is like when you're building like a, like a, big like a like a building you have a like an architect that puts like the how the beams and like the actual uh structure of that building is and then you have like the maybe the internal designers and the actual like like maybe uh contractors and people that actually build this like apartments and like how you, and all of this within the the structure and if you maybe let's say that somebody is like i want to build like a loft or something and i want to like have now you need to talk to the architect and can i actually yeah. do this can i actually extend like add a like some ladder in between or whatever like like these things need somebody to kind of now you need to talk um and 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 i think very similar discussions usually happen as well 100 percent. i yeah i mean I, the term is borrowed anyway from, yes, from exactly. construction right like it's yeah. and like our our industry is way way more <laughs> younger let's say than than, than the, fun, construction like the funny and, thing the funny yeah. thing like that's kind of like when you come for circle like my my my, my dad is an architect but an actual <laughs> architect okay and when i growing wow. up as part of being like like a rebellion i didn't want to i don't want to be an architect <laughs> i kind of go full circle <laughs> but you can end up yeah <laughs> yeah, like, yeah so that runs in the family i guess <laughs> okay, fantastic. Um, Hamad, based on your definition, I want to ask a follow-up question to that, which is why is there a need for this to be a separate function from software engineering, right? Like why can't software engineers yeah. do this, whatever you just described? And it's not like a separate function in the sense that like software engineers should not do architecture. That's that's not the what what works. It's basically just a function of, especially that in bigger systems. When you have like a, like breadth and depth, and both are very like large enough, no one person can actually maintain everything at the same time. Like yeah, you're expecting that you're within your functional area. There's a lot of depth. There is a lot of things that you need to architect within your area. Like it's not it's not gonna be uh, like an, I'm, I'm not gonna add a function here or like no. There's tons of complexity and things Services. within your area of expertise. So. So even if you try, like like even even as an architect, you don't even have a whole breadth of picture. That doesn't. You usually have a team, and you have you're working with your software engineer and tech leads and staff engineers, or whatever, just to get an idea of how complicated the system is. Especially that the system, like like that's maybe when, once that's one of the areas where the analogy kind of breaks down with actual architecture. That software is an organic architecture. It moves, changes. So it's like a function of time. Yeah, so rather than like an architecture, once you build a building, pretty much it's going to stay the same. Uh, but but in software, it as you're building it, it changes. <laughs> as you like, as you wait for a few minutes and it changes again, um, it's 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 kind of a it's it's fascinating, but it's also very challenging, and it's kind of hard for each each developer to be super aware of everything happening outside of their area of scope. Um, and it's also can some can sometimes very like kind of counterproductive. Like even if you try, that means that because something has to give. Like you only have twenty four hours a day, and you have to sleep sometimes. So it's it's very <laughs> so, so you need help. Um, so basically, that's where uh, you'll uh, you'll find like architecture and software can sometimes be interchangeable. Like like they can a software architect at some point of time they can decide to go depth a little bit, so they, they go in a certain area. And sometimes like an engineer will step out and come become more of a breath yeah. person so it, it depends that's great so it's more of an optimization of focus and uh just you know how where we are yes. spending our time on uh, versus not necessarily yeah. not having the skills to do it and whatnot. yeah no no yeah it's, it's it's also like it just requires a little bit more experience than just like a like a like a typical software engineer that there may be early in their career so mm -hmm. so it's not like he can be out of college starting work as a software architect that's kind yeah, of stretching it yeah. but but like yeah, you'll need a little bit of art because ch chances are you're you're drawing a lot from your previous experiences as you're kind of trying to figure out why things are the way they are. Is there a problem here or like it's that a potential problem there? 
um, like when you're modeling things, that's where a lot of like 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 uh, uh, software engineers and architects kind of like get in heated discussion sometimes. Exactly. Like when we're modeling a, like a database or a, or a store or whatever, there's a lot of cases where it might make sense if if you, if you didn't have enough experience to do it that way. It makes perfect sense. But unless you've seen the problem before, it's really hard to see the other side. So that's that's like having somebody that that doesn't need to be an architect per se. It just it might be like a very like a good senior senior engineer in the in the room. They can bring the other side of like yeah, this has a potential of of, of causing these issues. Uh, let's at, either address them or at least make sure that we're we're not gonna go into the same pitfalls again. So, but at least we know about them. Uh, exactly. Also, so yeah. Right? The battle yes. scars, they come into play. The experience comes into play. Exactly. That, that, that definitely, yeah. Fantastic. I want to move from this to talk about how should software architects be placed within, within an engineering organization? So in your experience, like, what is, the, what is a good structure for, that, that yeah. fosters collaboration, fosters a good dynamics between the software architects and the engineering uh, software engineers? So it's more, I think it's more art than science, to be honest, like, uh, because it depends also on the, on the, on each team dynamic. Uh, like sometimes some teams are much more, uh, like kind of the collaboration in a, is, is already like pretty, like people are talking, it's a small team, you know, a small enough team that people know each other's. So you don't need like a lot of, like maybe you need one architect or like over like maybe three, four groups of, of, of engineers. Um, but in some other cases where you like, happens to be like one of those siloed kind of, uh, organizations, you'll need more people just to kind of bridge these gaps uh, with each other. So it's always a function of, of, of that of that part. Like it's like how well you're communicating in general. Um, so it, like it's like I've, like I've seen cases where there was no architects whatsoever. So and and it's basically just like very senior engineers or principal engineers or staff plus like doing that role. And actually staff, staff engineers is one of those things that one of the personas of a staff engineer is an architect. Like it's like, like maybe just because architect is more of a role than a title. Like, a, like you're basically playing a role of architect, even if your title might be like a staff engineer or like something like so. So somebody is taking that role anyway, in most organization, you just might not giving it as a title. Uh, and that's totally fine. Uh, so, so it's it's one of those things like depends on the organization and as as many as many other things in software in general like like it depends on how big the organization is or um, or how complicated their systems. I mean, at the end of the day, as as we add more people, the complexity arises ex or grows exactly. exponentially, right? So yeah. obviously, if it's a small company, there's really no need for a software architect per se. Maybe someone can fulfill that function yeah. from the existing team. Yes, and the chances are you already have somebody fulfilling that function. Like it yeah. might be, as you said, like might be like a, just a senior engineer, or like maybe a, a tech lead or or a, or a manager that happens to be like be like a like a very experienced uh, experienced person. So so that 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 happens here. Yeah. Perfect. Um, you kind of already answered a question I wanted to ask right now, which is regarding, uh, you know, big tech and staff plus engineers who are doing yeah. software architecture. But maybe I would I ask the question in a different sure. way. Get, let's, can we explain or break down a little bit the hierarchies, um, you know, or at least the, the, the titles within big tech, you know, so we have software engineer one, two, three, maybe, and then there's senior and then there's staff and then principal and then lead. Do so yeah, so as I said, like it, it depends. Like not every company has the same set of titles, but mm -hmm. you can basically saying like you have the, your your fresh grad, your new, your kind of like the early career. Like you want to call it like for software engineer, call it whatever. You like it, but at least you have like that like that first step um, in that. And then you have like some maybe like a collection of titles, whether it's like one, two, three, or like whatever you want to call it. But they usually have a step between that per, that 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 level and the senior level. Okay. So you have like maybe your you, and that's usually your quickest like um, transition. If you're like a like if you're a solid engineer, chances are you going from from the software engineer like the first level to that middle level in pretty much pretty quickly, like in a year or two or something. Mm -hmm. um, you, uh, because usually what what means here, at least that's what I understand. Like uh, what means here is that you're 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 a solid engineer. You can really do your job. You have a great bit of autonomy. Like you can do things without really a lot of uh, handholding, but you still lack the vision or at least the kind of the high, like the wide scope. But that's okay. We we know you're gonna get there. So, but at least we know that we made a good hire. <laughs> so, so you're kind of moving to the next level. Mm -hmm. um, 
like once you kind of started start to have like way more autonomy like you you have like a kind of sharpened your a little bit more your communication skills you kind of know more people around your organization you know how to work with other functions you work for like for example if you're like a developer you work with like your qa or you work with your sre teams or kind of like you already build good relationships your program management or or something like that and you can also kind of um work independently so you can get like a big enough problem you can kind of have a have a plan for it design it kind of uh deliver it all the way and kind of have a pretty consistent delivery uh statistic like pretty much you always deliver uh you can we kind of become like a senior engineer at this point so you're you're very i remember like one of my managers like like when i when i reached the senior level he says like pretty much will say you're like deliver no matter what so that's that's kind of the expectation wow. on a senior level you deliver like that's pretty much like when 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 we have a senior on the team we're so that is it's an exaggeration but but kind of drives the point home there find always, a way. yes there is always exceptions to cases like there is a lot of projects that kind of crumbles but that not chances are it's not because like we hit some technical problem that has no solution like that's right. that's one of the rarest problems uh, usually some other things that kind of outside of the scope of technology that kind of make the problem goes, like, like the, the whole thing crumbles but and then you kind of start like, like one like that's very well defined like that the area between like a soft engineering to a senior that's very well defined pretty much almost the same across all the companies it becomes pretty pretty weird <laughs> once but, but after senior like some companies like they have like staff uh they have like um staff and principal and uh architect or whatever um so I think like the, some of those companies like Okta and Salesforce and like they have like this kind of hierarchy some other companies have like the principal level partner level whatever this like microsoft and and i think in vmware they also have a staff one staff two uh like the the they have different different names but i think they're all kind of the same thing like you're kind of reaching a point where everybody at that level at a senior level above they're all technically very very good like it's not a problem of being more technical okay so uh, chances are uh, like you know, kind of your technical abilities becomes secondary to other abilities that you're kind of bringing in like right. how you're kind of um uh, like maybe design is one of them like breaking a problem into uh like a manageable, manageable pieces like you have a big problem now that maybe requires a lot of like few teams to work together how we're going to break this in a way that makes sense and actually we can we can move forward with it and not just breaking it and following up with like making sure that this actually gets done eventually it's like not like basically breaking and leaving that's <laughs> like no you're breaking and kind of <laughs> following through <laughs> until the whole thing gets delivered and uh, and also jumping in in the areas where it can become pretty uh like uh, we hit some pretty bad uh, like performance issue or whatever and you can jump in and help and bring in your uh, like expertise to kind of like alleviate this problem and 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 doing the same in like in, in other areas as well and kind of partner and have like good reputation around the, the the organization in general so this is where you're kind of shining more with your personal abilities rather than your technical abilities your technical abilities are, the, are a given at this stage but you're kind of like capitalizing on the other aspects yeah, correct. Um, and it's about your influence also across the organization exactly. and your ability to drive things forward. Yes, exactly. Um, and yeah. create a bigger impact overall. Exactly. Yeah. And so, so that, that's all basically, uh, uh, at least that's how I look at this. Like, obviously, there's t tons of ways to look at this. But at the end of the day, this is where you kind of find uh the the differences and when when somebody gets promoted or somebody else does like get promoted you find most probably technical ability is not necessarily that that deciding factor at this stage it's like how effective or how influential and how many people are usually in your on a, or how many teams basically in this stage like on on daily basis or, or regularly you work with um and your influence on them and that's that's the more important part usually yeah, and many organizations, example, GitHub is one of them, for example, a staff engineer is, is basically the counterpart of an engineering manager. Like it's like the technical partner of an engineering yeah. manager. Principal mm -hmm. goes up even one level. So principal engineers are, are at a director level, yeah. right? And they are expected to perform at the director level mm -hmm. in addition to their technical competencies. Yep, that's true. All right, that's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. Let's move on to the uh, next uh, question I have, which is regarding 
the tension between architects and engineers, <laughs> right? Uh, I had some of that tension in my in my previous uh, in previous roles. Like the funny funny story, um, uh, there at, at at one organization I was in, I had the title of a, a solution architect. Uh, but it was more of a software architect type of work. Um, and we were having a small coffee break with the engineers. I was new. The engineers didn't really know what, what type of role I was I was uh, having. And pretty much throughout the whole conversation, they were complaining about software uh, solution architects and software architects and how, how irrelevant they how are. How detached today, today. we are from the reality. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yes. How detached we are, right? And how, how high level we, we design stuff that is not really applicable to their... Yeah. whatever they are building right so uh, and also there, there's an implicit hierarchy between the roles and i say implicit because it's not very well defined no one really comes in and says yeah software engineers should report to architects in any way shape or form uh, we just look at it as different function but still the, the hierarchy is there um i want from your perspective um have you yeah. seen this and how do you approach this co the collaboration with software engineers it's it's oh definitely there it's very very challenging and i think it's kind of boils down to the idea of like influence without authority kind of thing like you're you, you don't have authority on like on, on engineers to tell them to do one thing or another like you're usually based most of this tra like relationship is based on trust um so you you have to spend enough time to know your team uh, you kind of build a good personal relationship with them, build trust with them, help them uh, in, in cases where they actually need help. Like there is a lot of cases where you like, um, there's like a production issue happening or something. Like you shouldn't be like, yeah, I'm an architect. I don't care about these things. It's like go somewhere. It's like, no, you can be helpful. <laughs> so, yeah. so you can go there, like you can can support, you can actually kind of help, especially when, when everybody's kind of like on their, like, um, uh, like very stressed out, you can be the calm, calm personality in the room, trying to kind of make sure that not everyone is kind of chasing things that doesn't matter. So at least help help uh, build this relationship, especially in tough times. And it helps quite a bit once you have this relationship that now you can kind of have a better conversation. You can have uh, like whenever the design is something, uh, they might be, they, they should be the ones kind of reaching out to you. It's like like yeah, what. Are, like, do you, what do you think of this? The, and you kind of start kind of discussing trade-offs. And and also, since you have a little bit more of a wider scope, you can either find similarities that can help. So it's like, yeah, why do you know, why, why we're building this one? There's a team already that is building something else or building on something that you might not be aware of. Let's actually maybe like sync up and see if we can leverage the same thing instead of like, like rebuilding this or, or like wasting time there um and 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 these things are are where developers will find you very helpful because like they they know that they cannot keep track of everything happening around them uh and and you shouldn't be the ones kind of like coming into the internals of their lo logic telling them why you're doing this or it's this like why you're using that library and not lab library like you know, why, why do you care like it's sometimes you should but some but more often you don't really care. Like sometimes you don't even know, but like you don't even care what language they're using, or they already they already made that decision like years before you joined. So it's like it's not necessarily like you're uh, you're adding a lot of value in that area, but you add more value when you, when you kind of bridge like these gaps uh, between like, communication and stuff. So where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line on on your engagement level? You know, when it comes to the code base and, and working with software. Yes. So it so it depends. Like like it's it's hard. Like that's what I'm saying. Like it's there isn't like like a, a rule of thumb that you can follow in these areas. There's a lot of cases where you can see, and that's something we sometimes you need to hold yourself back a little bit. When you see code bases that are it can be better, but you know that it's like you don't know the amount of pressure that on the team at this point. Um, that you don't know if it's it might be not worth going after this specific problem that even if you discuss you want to waste a lot of people's time and it's not, like the outcome is like yeah we it looks better now like okay like who cares <laughs> like so it, it, it sometimes like you're not you're not their lead like you're not your tech their tech lead like maybe that's more of a tech lead uh like function that the you can maybe discuss with them have a good relationship with them and kind of trying to popularize more like um better coding practices and in the hope that they can kind of carry this over to their team, but but you kind of coming in and like jumping in the code review and saying like, yeah, you're you better put that curly brace in the next line. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. so it's so it's kind of these things 
like yeah like that's not where you're supposed to be but but in many other places maybe like for example if it's a distributed system or something and you 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 know that there is like a lot of value in like maybe adding certain uh metrics or certain like um log log statements in like areas that might make troubleshooting harder or something so not necessarily jumping for a specific one but maybe putting a standard or putting a, a, a like a, a a best practice, best practice that eventually teams can pull from and kind of help this popularize this because it has that has much more impact on on like the uh, time wasted or like like mean time to recovery and these kind of things than just like like a uh, like a refactoring a piece of code so yeah. so like because that's kind of draws back to your like to your priorities like if you if you're like um, like you, you kind of maintain your structure of the system. You want to make sure that these metrics are not necessarily affected uh, negatively as time goes. Like mean time to recovery is a very important metric for distributed systems in general. Uh, influenced influenced by like, do I have enough troubleshooting information? Do I have enough metrics and, and data so I can actually, if something goes wrong, I know how where to start and and what where to find my problem. So this is where you kind of find yourself a little bit more helpful in, in these areas. So. It's, 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 like, it's not it's not easy um in some place maybe let's say you found that like a potential security issue now yeah you would be jumping in if you especially if you know um you'll be jumping in there even if it's not necessarily but at least you'll start a discussion so it depends i hear you um that's that's fantastic i mean in previous roles i found myself uh, spending a lot of time for example working on documentation defining best practices um aligning arrows and diagrams <laughs> <laughs> That's the fun part. <laughs> yes. Right, doing a lot of this stuff, but also um, a lot of the communication with the leadership teams is, mm -hmm. is very important, right? Like breaking down the technical into what it means from a business perspective, because at the end of the yeah. day, whether we like it or not, we our roles, even as software engineers, is to drive the business forward. Mm -hmm. That's what matters the most, uh, you know, if we're not doing this for fun. Um, so how do you spend your day right now? I mean, if you're able to talk a little bit more about it, uh, you know, as a software architect, how, 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 how do you spend your time? What so, so for me right now, because I have just like one month in in a new job, so a lot of my time is basically just trying to learn, like, and especially when I'm in a system that is kind of like very well established, has been along for a, uh, like around for a long time. So it's hard to kind of uh, start being super active and productive and providing like potential changes without actually understanding enough of it. So for me, that's kind of a special case at this point. So, so. Um, uh, which it can be a whole like subject for a whole different discussion, like how we can ramp up, especially as an architect, because like that's kind of a breath is pretty hard as an architect. But anyway, uh, like for but for in, in other in in other uh, cases, especially when you, let's say that you already established in a place that you've been in a, in a key, you have enough experience in it. Um, you're I think you you want to make sure that you you know what your success metrics or success criteria are like at least in terms of business like like what are we trying to achieve to like especially that's a project or something that you're working with the team on what are we trying to achieve here in terms of business metrics and we're making sure that these business metrics are we actually have a way to measure them in in in, in, the, in the product like uh, like we might have a fantastic product but at the end of the day like we we maybe promised like 30 percent year over year whatever it's like so do we actually have something to track this? <laughs> like, we have no idea if, if, and so unless that metric gets translated somehow into part of the product that we can keep track of, of it, so that we now we can make our priorities, like whenever we add a feature, or like we wanna kind of contention resources or something, whatever is gonna actually help me move that needle um, toward the, 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 the goal that we have. So, so that's that's part of where you conversation with your business partners, like your program manager or product manager, whatever you want to call them. Uh, this is where you want to make sure that you have a clear clear idea of how this project is going to be considered successful, and also that, that that's that that's kind of the goal that's your north star, but also how like how we're going to break, especially if it's a long project that's going to take like a like long time to to uh, to deliver to the market. That's something you're working with your engineering leads or engineering managers, how we're going to phase this out. Uh, so our, like, what is the, like, for example, like the, my MVP or what's the first phase of the project that is going to like, 
and is, is that acceptable from business like this specific scope is it enough as a first step and it, when is the right time so we can put some timelines on, on it and then like what's the next phase and so on and so forth and how how flexible we are to take uh, feedback because once we have something out uh, we might have some idea of what we were trying to do before but now we got a feedback that kind of changed everything so how flexible we're gonna we're gonna work with this so we want to keep that feedback loop going and also make sure that the the the, the pressure on the team or or at least the, the feedback from the team to the business is also kind of reaching the other side as well so if, for example if we if we had to do a lot of shortcuts to get the mvp out um now when is the time to kind of pay back that debt we need maybe some time it's not we're not going to stop everything to pay the debt back but at least we need to have some of the capacity toward that otherwise it's gonna kind of accumulate and eventually it's gonna we're gonna come to a complete halt yeah. so we we'll, we we'll need to do to, to kind of have this understanding between the two sides Sounds a lot like a technical co-founder in a startup, you know. <laughs> it's, the, it's the same problems. It's the same yeah. problems. Like, yeah, it's, uh, and, and sometimes you have, like, and that's the thing, like, even though it's debt, especially with, with tech, it's not all debts are bad, are bad. Like, sometimes you have a debt just to keep the, to, to meet the market uh, where, it's at, where it's at, but but at least you need to be aware of it. Correct. Yeah, and sometimes even by the time it comes to you know pay the debt, the debt becomes obsolete. Like paying it yes. just has no additional value exactly. anymore. So exactly. you just gotta dismiss it. That's fantastic. Um, I have a couple of questions before we wrap up. Um, what do you think are good characteristics uh, and can maybe character traits or maybe even skills that a software architect should have? Uh, yeah, I, th I think it's. Um... <laughs> It's the idea that you can break down bigger problems into um, like uh, manageable pieces. Um, that's something it's hard to define. And I, I I know, but it's it's kind of a, a kind of you're building on your training as a software engineer uh, that you're kind of you have to build the like de decompose or like your problem into smaller problem. Even if you're building like a small game or something, you're still doing that but in a, a slightly bigger scope. So now you're you're like breaking a business problem and trying to fit it into either existing uh, um, existing systems or, or building new components or something. And that's something you need to, to learn how to do. Um, there are also the other part is kind of, there is part of it politics as well. You need to be aware of the politics around you uh, because like, I think it's called the Conway law, uh, which is like, like your architecture pretty much matches your org chart. Um, so, so it's it goes hand in hand. Like your your architecture and how the politics work can also affect your architecture sometimes. Like for better or for worse, sometimes you'll find that yeah, adding a change in that area is going to be a nightmare just to go through this. So we might as well just do it somewhere else, even though that we know that's not necessarily a technical sound solution, but because we have other things to try to do. So, the, so the friction like being that comes from exactly being realistic and pragmatic sometimes helps. Not too much, not too little, but at least you'll need to be like pragmatic in a sense that we're trying to run a business here. <laughs> so like we have to achieve something. Um, so so that's in, that's that's pretty important as well. And also like being like an overall kind of um, open for like communication with, with with people. Like you're like in general like you're somebody you can easy to talk to. Like because most of your job is. Kind of talking to people actually, uh, exactly. so and reiterating what you're saying and and actually listening a lot of times to, but especially in, in in an area that you're not familiar with, you're listening a lot like to how things are the way they are, and also kind of ha have a great deal of uh, empathy about like how th like the, the the things the, the way the way they are because there is what the good reason or there was there were good reasons. Um, not because people were like, yeah, just like doing that way, like randomly or like just because they don't care. Um, so, and sometimes like asking these right questions with like why and keep asking why and why and why that kind of help you kind of get to the bottom of why this, like what the root cause of most of your problems are. Uh, or at least you, you, you understand and you might actually, yeah, that was the best decision given the, all the circumstances. Uh, and and let's move move forward. So at least you don't waste your time trying to fix a problem that cannot be fixed. At least at this, if the circumstances are the same. Fantastic. This is uh, this is really great, and I definitely relate to a lot of what you just said. Um, I think the last question for me is: 
uh, and probably the question of a lot of people who start, uh, you know, veering off the day-to-day -day coding or, you know, yeah. being technical all the time. How do you stay relevant technically? <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. And it's um, you, you kind of, uh, and I think that start even before, like way before you, like you're looking into being an architect or something. Um, if, like when, you, when you're early in your career, kind of the world is your oyster. You kind of like look on everywhere. Uh, everything is up for grab. You can try everything. Um, but as, as you kind of pro progress and you try, you try to read a few things, you kind of know what things you like and you don't like. Um, for example, you might like for, for me, for example, at some point I was like, yeah, I'm not going to work in mobile ever. <laughs> so, so I kind of like, all right, I'm not going to do that. I don't care about this area. I am more of a user in the area and I'm fine with it. Uh, or I'm never going to build a game. So, so kind of like you start kind of dropping areas, uh, that you don't, so at least you trim the noise. Like, uh, you, you're, you're kind of trying to focus on areas that you're like, you're, uh, want to follow. So you can't follow everything. Uh, so, but other people might have different choices. Like they might like, yeah, I don't want to, I don't care about web development or I don't want to care about security or that's, they have other things to focus on. So, so at, le at, at least you, you need to find the areas that you are interested in that you need to focus on. And even within this, try to kind of, um, attend a conference every year or so, uh, in that, in that, in that area. Um, even if you can attend it physically, obviously for our different reasons, but at least kind of hear about like like watch these things every now and then read like keep reading books in your area at least at least have a one good book every every year like it gets harder to keep like technical books like reading technical books because it's not, it's not like a novel you can like listen to when you're driving like a technical book requires some focus so like put a goal for at least a book a year or something um uh, if you can do more that's awesome but but at least so so it doesn't need to be all or nothing like uh, and sometimes the one, you, you, at a certain level you might not need a lot of like depth in each of the areas but at least you need to be aware of their existence and you will never know when one of those areas kind of pop in your <laughs> in your work and you now you know about it so you can go and actually like yeah go crazy and go as deep as you want and understand that all the aspects of it uh, and you'll find the time to do it at that point but at least knowing about these things is pretty important Fantastic. Um, I could speak to you for hours, Muhammad. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I relate to a lot of what you're saying. I, I feel like our conversation is quite fun. Um, yeah. The last thing I want to ask you before we wrap up is uh, what is currently on your mind? Is there like an area that you're focusing on right now? I know you're, like you're trying to absorb everything from the new job, um, but like, is there an area that is currently top of mind or something a domain that you're currently trying to explore or learn more about? Um... There is like like for me I'm I'm in a transition because I used to be in the identity space and security space which was fun for like maybe eight years and and eventually I'm kind of transitioned to a whole different place so now I'm kind of in a business different business entertainment and media and it's a whole different game so for me it's like I'm trying to understand the business part of it because like uh, like that's a business I have been in Hulu before but uh, what long long time ago I was also like in a street video streaming and I'm not necessarily in that same area. So I'm kind of trying to get a feeling of how the business works, that, that what the priorities of it, and the, similar to what I uh, what I used to do in the, in the identity space before. So for me, that's the area of focus more. It's not necessarily a technical problem. Uh, like I'm not asking for like I'm not looking for the technical side of it yet. I'm trying to understand the business part, um, which helps because that once you kind of get how the money works in that area, like how people are. Uh, like studios work with streaming services or whatever, like you kind of make a mental model how this works. You kind of know where with the important art, and then the technical parts can come. I couldn't agree more. I love this because um, personally, I've been able to move up in my career purely from the focus on understanding the industry vertical I'm in, understanding the business we're in, understanding how we make money, understanding what is cost, and positioning myself in these areas where I can add much value to the business. And that's what helps um, a lot of us drive, drive our career. Exactly, forward. yes. Hamad, uh, this has been really a blast. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate I can't it. thank you enough. Uh, no problem. Anytime. Anytime. I so. definitely think we're going to have future episodes. There are a lot of topics that Anytime. I'd love to explore with you. Sure. Yeah.
any closing hopefully, thoughts. Hopefully visit Seattle soon, so we can actually have a... a I hope so. I'm, again, as, as with all people who have uh, passports from the Middle Eastern area, <laughs> I'm trying to <laughs> yeah. figure out my visa right now. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to meet up soon, that's for sure. Right. Uh, any closing thoughts uh, for, for the audience? Uh, no, but keep up the good work, man. Like I, I love your setup as a that's a more of a as, a as a fellow YouTuber and podcaster. Like I love your setup. I love your like how you uh, like the lighting and everything. I appreciate that really, uh, really much as much as I can. Like I can't really say much about it, but but yeah, but that's uh, keep up the great work, and I'm 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 always following that. Thank you. I'm always following you as well. Uh, you've been a big supporter of this channel from the start. You have your own uh, stuff, which I'm going to be putting in the description and in this video so that uh, people who don't know you can actually go and follow. You have a lot of great content. You've been in this field for a decade plus, I think, and uh, we're all learning from you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Take care.